Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday morning online here, worshipping together as a community of faith here at Sunshine Salvos. It's another chilly morning, but I hope that where you are, you're feeling nice and warm and feeling at least even though we still find ourselves in isolation, still feeling a little close to each other as we can draw together in this digital space in the coming hour or so. I want to pay my respects to the traditional elders of the land upon which I, I am at this time, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and uh, want to just um, honour them and, uh, and, and, and acknowledge them because uh, I don't just do this acknowledgement because it's politically correct or because it's the right thing to do when other people were doing it. I do it because I genuinely believe that we do need to always remember and honour the traditional owners um, of the land that we gather on. It's the right thing. It's the just thing, the respectful thing to do. So I pay my respects to elders past and present and those future emerging leaders within our First Nations community and also honour the traditional owners of the lands where you are gathered in your space this morning. We've had uh, a week this week that's really had some shadows cast over, especially in our local community, really mindful this morning that there are many hurting people in our local community in Brimbank. Thinking particularly of the tragic events that happened during the week out at Deer Park. And, uh, and, and I'm going to just share a prayer shortly uh, that uh, speaks over that awful situation. And, and, and in, in all honesty, all we can do when things like this happen in our midst, when people are hurt and broken, harmed, um, all we can do is to bring that situation to God in prayer and bring those family before the Lord. And so I will do that shortly. But we also have other people in our faith community here at Sunshine Salvos who are not feeling the best at the moment. I'll also remember them in prayer as well. But before I do pray, I want to read to you this prayer, which I think is a good prayer for us to consider this morning and pray with a heart of contrition. And so join with me as I read this and then I will flow into a prayer after. God of mercy, Justice and truth forgive us when we deplore violence in our cities. But if we then live in suburbs where lawns are clipped and churches are enlarged and beautified, when we condemn the apathy of our society, but then if we close our eyes to our own comforts and affluence, forgive us for cheering legislators who promise low taxes but then deny homes and schools for those who are truly in need. Forgive us for self-righteousness that blames the poor for their poverty or the oppressed for their oppression. Forgive us for not wanting to recognise our relatives in your family who are black or red or yellow or white, whose children's children may well be our grandchildren. For accepting people we like, but for rejecting those who we do not like, because they are not of our class or colour. Forgive us, Lord, for turning our churches into private clubs, for loving familiar hymns and religious feelings more than actually we love you. Forgive us, Lord, for pasting stained glass on our eyes and on our ears to shut out the cry of the hungry and the hurt in the world. God of mercy, justice 
and truth this morning, Lord, please forgive us. Let us pray together. Father, we offer up our prayer of repentance alongside this prayer, Lord, of intercession in praying for those who are hurting, especially in our local community, the community at large and also within our own faith community. Lord, I want to lift up to you the family of that dear boy, Solomone Kalfa Ulungaki, who was so tragically taken this week. In, in circumstances, Lord, we cannot imagine. No, Lord, we know they're a family of faith. We have every confidence that, that they know that Solomon is with the Lord and that he is peaceful and safe and secure. But Lord, for that family at this time who are feeling so bereft and broken and just cut down to nothing, Lord, we, we pray that you your spirit of peace would just be with them, continuing to heal them, to soothe them, to comfort them, wipe away their tears, Lord, but also allow their tears to run where they need to. Lord, we pray for that family. Bless them, comfort them. Pray for their faith community at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints there in Deer Park. Lord, be with them as they comfort and counsel and guide their brothers and sisters through this awful time. Lord, be their strength, be their wisdom. And we pray for those other families as well of the perpetrators of what happened to that boy. Lord, be with them, comfort them, strengthen them, give them every resource they need to be able to deal with this time. And with the boys themselves, Lord, comfort them, be with them. May your spirit of wisdom and truth and peace be very prevalent in this situation at this time and continue to draw together, particularly the Pacifica Island community who are hurting so much for this incident. Lord, be with them. I also want to pray for my brothers and sisters at Caris Mentoring who are doing an amazing job with the families of those who have been affected by this awful tragedy. Lord, I pray for Lusa, for, for, for all of the guys who are involved who are supporting that community. Lord, be with them. Give them the words to say. Give them big arms to hold. Give them firm feet to stand by those who are hurting at this time. Lord, we just lift up that situation to you. We don't understand why these things happen. We grieve when they do happen. All we can do is to offer the situation to you, Lord, in prayer. And we do that this morning. Lord, be with all affected by what happened this week in Deer Park. We want to also pray for Joe this morning, who still isn't feeling the best, still has her medical professionals uh, trying to find the right balance of medications and things for her ongoing well-being. Lord, be with Jo. Give her strength and patience uh, to, to just um, get through these days. Pray also for Diane and all her family who this week farewelled her mum. Lord, I just pray you would continue to be her strength, her comfort in these days of remembrance. Lord, be with her Continue to be with that little boy that I spoke about last week. Just so young, so new to this world, but, but still with so many health needs now. Lord, be with him. Be with Thomas uh, this morning. Be with that little boy and his family as well. And Lord, we just pray for others within our network, our community of faith, Lord. Be with us all, strengthen us in these days where we still find ourselves isolated, still unable to gather together. Lord, even in this time, draw us together even closer to each other in love. Bless us, Lord, as we worship you this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good to see many of you joining us here this morning. Anne and Ernst, good morning to you. Good morning to friends and family over in Box Hill. To Sean, good to see you, mate. Good to see our friends in Melton joining us. Stephen, Joy, Margaret Kelly, good morning to you. And Norm as well, Norman Moo. Good morning, Anthony. There in Tyler Street, enjoying the service along with Carmen and Tony. I know, I think a couple of weeks ago, it was Carmen's birthday. So although we couldn't mention it on the morning, happy birthday for then, Carmen. It's great to have you here this morning, along with Tony, Marcia, good to see you, and Margaret Dyer. Lovely to have you with us this morning. Good morning to the trans, Tao and Tan, and others who will join us in due course in our worship, which we're going to continue doing now. Got our worship leader here this morning, Lusa, who's going to join us in uh, bringing three songs this morning in our worship. Blessed be your name. Change my heart, O oh God. The lovely um, refrain in that chorus, you are the potter, I am the clay, mould me and make me. This is what we pray, which leads into the final chorus and song we're going to worship with this morning, the potter's hand. Thanks, Lucy, for leading us this morning. Good morning, family. It's great to be back uh, worshipping with you all. So, um, as we get into a time of worship, a time of praise, um, I just guess what I just want to echo what Colin's been talking about with all the tragedies that have been going on. Um, I really love um, worship. For me, worship is a, an, ex, an, ex, an, express, an expression of love for me to God, and I just hope that. As we worship or as we praise that you know you're uplifted throughout this time in his life. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found that desert place go walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Oh. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the glorious name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Lord Jesus, we come here before you to give you all the glory, and honor, and praise, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. You are the King of the Kings. You are the Lord of Lords, Lord Jesus. Only you, only love can overcome what hate is going on in this world at the moment, Lord Jesus. So we pray 
that you just comfort us with your love this morning. Only you can transform our hearts, only you can transform our minds. So we ask for more of you this morning. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Lord Jesus, we ask for more of you, Lord Jesus, to mold us, to break us, Lord Jesus, so that we can continue to do more in your world, Lord Jesus. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure, all of my days are held in your hands, crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit, teach me the Use 
this moment just to be with God, just to be in His presence. That's what we want this morning, Lord Jesus, sister. Know you more, Lord Jesus. To learn more of your peace, Lord Jesus. For if we know your peace, then we know what peace really feels like, Lord Jesus. And then we can feel at peace. Through everything that's going on, only, only your light can shine through this darkness, Lord Jesus. And so we want to be torches for you, Lord Jesus. To be able to stand firm. To walk beside to be guided by you, to be led by you, Lord Jesus. So we pray this morning that you use us, that you speak to us, and that you fill us with your Holy Spirit through the words this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Change our hearts, transform our minds, Lord Jesus, to know you more. We all say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear family. Thank you, Lusa, for really taking us to a, a place near to the throne of grace this morning in worship. And again, you know, I, I want to commend you for the what you're doing with grieving families over this side of town. I don't know if you saw the news this week, Lusa was on the news. He was there with a whole bunch of students in the school that that uh, boy Solomone went to supporting them, uh, doing a haka or something with them. And um, and importantly, Lucy wasn't standing in front of them. He wasn't standing behind them, standing right there alongside them. And uh, Lucy and and his friends at Karis are just doing a, an amazing job in, in just being used by God in a positive and um, healing way uh, with a community that's really broken at the moment. So we we'll continue to pray for you, mate, and thank you for this morning. I don't really have many announcements to make this morning. I, you will know that yesterday the Premier announced that there is a slight stepping back in our progress forwards as far as the lifting of restrictions is concerned. Um, 
it just reinforces to us here at Sunshine Salvos that when it comes to the plans that we have and have made, that those plans are really subject to change. Um, and we're really uh, guided by certainly our government, um, also by the Salvation Army itself, in terms of the road forward and how quickly that happens. And so I will certainly keep you in the loop of what will be happening next month. We still hope that we can uh, bring back some of our regular um, programs that we offer at Sunshine Salvos, uh, wonderful ministries such as Mainly Music, Just Brass, uh, the Women's Gathering, Shine. We, we really do hope that some of those pillar programs that really do hold up and, and gird who we are at Sunshine Salvos can return. But of course, we are in a, an environment that is a, a shifting, moving landscape. Uh, things change day by day in terms of how this coronavirus um, is affecting our community and, and the things that need to be done to, uh, to work around that in the best way possible. So I will keep you posted about where things are at and, and how things look, particularly for next month in the return of some of our programs. And that's all the announcements I really can make at this time. We continue down at Sunshine Salvos, of course, to uh, provide um, the best support we can to the community at this time. And that is expressed through our, our material aid, particularly food, emergency food provision. Um, uh, we, we were really blessed this week to be able to again be able to partner with the Vietnamese community in Australia the Victorian chapter of, of that organisation to be able to uh, be a part of and put together 57 hampers that went out to Vietnamese seniors all across this side of Melbourne. Uh, fortunately, Fung and I didn't have to do the, the driving work this time. There was a number of volunteers from the Vietnamese community who, who actually uh, couriered out all of those hampers to all the people, the recipients, which was lovely, but it's really good to be able to partner with organisations external to us because we are all on the same team. We're all working towards the same goals of ensuring that everyone in our community is safe and that those who are vulnerable and isolated have their needs met and that they are not forgotten. So that was a, a wonderful blessing for us again this week to to participate in, to be a part of. We give thanks to God for the friends we have in our local community. Good to see a few more people joining us here this morning. Joy, good to see you. Good to see you, Hilary and Kevin out in Melton. Good to see you. Jennifer and Matt. And others who will continue to join us over the coming over the coming minutes and time we have ahead of us. We're going to continue our journey this morning with Nehemiah and what he speaks to us at this time. And it's a a time this morning where you'll be placed in the situation of not just having to listen this morning to the message, but you're really going to have to think through this because I'm going to be offering you a different perspective of Nehemiah this morning that will really be food for thought. So we read from Nehemiah 2 this morning. Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. Early the following spring, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes reign, I, this is Nehemiah speaking in the first person, I was serving the king, his wine. I'd never appeared sad in his presence before this time. 
So the king asked me, why are you so sad? You aren't sick, are you? You look like a man with deep troubles. Then I was badly frightened, but I replied, long live the king. Why shouldn't I be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been burned down. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God in heaven, I replied, if it would please your majesty, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, please send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? So the king agreed, and I set a date for my departure. I also said to the king, if it pleases your majesty, give me letters to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please send a letter to Asaf, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress and for the city walls and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. When I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard of my arrival, they were very angry that someone had come who was interested in helping Israel. Three days after my arrival at Jerusalem, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey that I myself was riding. I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So I went up the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. The city officials did not, did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the religious or political leaders, the officials or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know full well that the tragedy of the city is here in front of you. It lies in ruins and its gates are burned. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and rid ourselves of this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been upon me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, good, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. But then Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan and they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing rebelling against the king like this? They asked. But I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you have no stake or claim in Jerusalem. May God add wisdom to the reading of his word this morning. Last week, we encountered Nehemiah first learning about the tragedy that had befallen his hometown, Jerusalem, remembering that most of uh, Judah and the Israelites at that time had been taken into exile and, and were living in exile. And so when Nehemiah heard of the state 
of the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, he grieved. His heart response was to cry. And then, importantly, his next response was to pray. And last week we talked about how that really is a, a template for all of us when things come along in life that deeply grieve us, that cause tears to come, that it's good and it's right to cry, but then to pray. And it's through prayer, I believe, that Nehemiah had a resolve and established a strong, single-minded resolve to try and do something about this fallen and broken condition of the walls and gates of Jerusalem. And so what I've just read in chapter 2 is his response, the response of his tears and his prayers, his resolve to go to the king and ask if he could return to Jerusalem to go about the task of repairing the gates and walls. He had to do that very carefully, very politically, very judiciously. But he managed through his resolve to convince the king to let him go and to do that task. Of course, remembering that Judah itself and Jerusalem as its capital were Persian vassal states or provinces. They weren't independent. It wasn't the king allowing Nehemiah or letting him go and saying, that's okay, you can go back to your home country and be your home country independent of us again. No, it wasn't that at all. It was the king allowing one of his administrators to go back to a Persian province and help sort some things out. And so Nehemiah began the process of doing that. And we see in the text that I just read that he had opposition. Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, who had their own reasons for opposing what Nehemiah resolved to do. Nevertheless, as the text progressed this morning, we see that in the dead of night, Nehemiah got around on his donkey and just systematically checked out exactly what needed to be done around the walls that were broken and the gates that were burned, making a checklist, a mental note, if you like, of the things that would need to be done. And so he did that. And then following that, he went to the religious leaders in Jerusalem at that time and explained to them his presence and what his resolve had brought him back to Jerusalem to do. And they were on board, and so the work of restoring the gates and the walls of Jerusalem would begin. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. The purpose for going back to the story of Nehemiah for us as a community of faith is really to try and draw some parallels between Nehemiah's situation, his context, in being in a place where things were broken, where things needed to be done, that there needed to be a rebuilding, to find parallels between that and also where we might find ourselves now as a community of faith in this COVID-19 time of isolation. Um, and, and, and reflecting on the things that we might learn from Nehemiah and his resolve and his action and taking those things and also taking the things that perhaps we would want to just leave outside of our context that Nehemiah also represents. I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning because whilst Nehemiah's resolve was strong, whilst the scripture presents his aspirations as being noble, there are certainly parts of Nehemiah's motivation that we really do need to question in a mature and a critical way in order to fully understand this man. Because I believe we do need to fully understand Nehemiah's mo motivation, his resolve, to be able to then, in the right way, apply the principles and the truths of his actions and his motivation into our context. 
it's no good for us just to be blindly assuming that everything about Nehemiah and his motivations and his actions were pure and holy and right, because certainly for him they were, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were perhaps right or just or fair for others, or that he didn't have motivations that run countercultural or run against what our motivations for what a faith community means in today's world for us. In short, Nehemiah, and I would also put into the, that um, this conversation the, the biblical figure of Ezra as well. Ezra and Nehemiah were both passionately concerned with re-establishing a Jewish state that was pure, that was unadulterated, that was separated and isolated from every influence that could possibly infect or contaminate them. Ezra and Nehemiah have often been called the fathers of modern Judaism because that really grew as an aspiration of modern, especially Orthodox Judaism, to separate themselves and not to allow their faith and their communities to be infiltrated or contaminated by outside influences. That was Nehemiah's motivation. That was where he was coming from. That's why Nehemiah was passionate about wanting to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You see, walls are a defence. We know that. We know that in that time, cities needed defending, especially in that region. Walls help people keep safe from inside, but walls also keep people out. And it was Nehemiah's motivation, his resolve, that Israel, the people of Israel, the people of Judah, needed again to separate themselves from all the world and start again. Now, the reason why that was so important to Nehemiah is because he was a Jew who had been taken into exile. He'd been taken out of the land. Those who were left behind in Judah in that time, in the time of the exile, went out and became a lot more cosmopolitan, if you like. They began to mix with other people. They began to um, see that there was a bigger world out there, that there were communities and people around who um, they could deal with, trade with, live with. As a result of that, many Judeans who were left behind in Israel, in Jerusalem, uh, intermarried. Married women, men from other cultures, and that was quite common. And, and it's a fact when we go through the story of Nehemiah, and, and particularly Ezra, uh, that the whole issue of intermarriage was an incredibly important issue for them. They were so, so firmly against intermarriage uh, that we have instances, for example, where Ezra is seen literally pulling the beard, the hair out of men's beards and off the hair of their head. He'd have a tough time with me, of course, but he could get my beard. Um, but so anti um, Jewish men, particularly having wives who they had married from different cultures. Of course, you know, if Nehemiah and Ezra walked into Sunshine Salvos and asked to speak to the leaders of that core, then they'd be horrified, wouldn't they? And I'd be running, trying to keep my beard safe. That was the motivation of Nehemiah. He wanted a Jerusalem that was pure. They wanted to start their nation again because it had gotten so mixed up with different ethnicities and different cultures. And within God's word, as you read it, 
there is just a almost a, a, a tacit understanding that that's okay, that that's good in some way. I'd challenge that and say that there's nothing about that attitude to me that really is endearing at all or positive. Nehemiah wanted to build walls and rebuild walls and gates around Jerusalem for a very single-minded and exclusionary reasons to keep people out. That's not who we are at Sunshine Salvos. We are a church without walls. We're a church that wants people to come in. We're a church that wants to include people. We're not hung up with who our members marry if they happen to marry outside of their racial group. That's not an issue. We're not hung up on the differences of people. We're a diverse faith community and we accept and love each other for who we are. I tell you, Nehemiah couldn't cope in Sunshine Salvos. He wouldn't be able to cope with that. And it's interesting when we look at the, the opponents of Nehemiah, Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, all are from different places. Sanballat particularly is an interesting character because he was, a, he was from Samaria, a Samaritan. And it was um, fair enough in some ways that Sanballat had issues with Nehemiah wanting to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because what that meant for Sanballat and his people was that they would not then be able to access the temple to worship. The Jews were very clear that only the main temple in Jerusalem could be accessed for worship by Jews. Samaritans were not welcome. That's why they went and worshiped on their mountain up in the north of Israel, the Mount Gerizim. So Sanballat in some ways had a grievance against Nehemiah that we could understand as being somewhat justified. You're going to rebuild the walls to keep my people out so that we can't worship the same God as you do, which the Samaritans did. So the picture I'm painting this morning with Nehemiah and his resolve is that if we understand his resolve just simply in black and white terms, that his resolve was good and holy and pure, then we're not seeing the whole picture of who Nehemiah is. And I, and I don't want you to understand Nehemiah in a one dimensional way. He needs to be understood and seen for all of who he was. Now, in saying all of that and painting a, a perhaps a, a, a little darker shade or picture of Nehemiah this morning, I do want to say that in his mind and for his people, he was incredibly resourceful, incredibly faithful and incredibly prayerful and reliant on God for what he was about to do and achieve. And he did achieve exactly what he set out to do. There are positive things we can take from Nehemiah and his resolve for how he rebuilt the walls and how he refurnished and reestablished the gates of Jerusalem. In the coming weeks, we're going to go over a lot of those gates and see what they teach us. So there are those positive things. Nehemiah cried, he prayed, he resolved. They're, all, they're, they're the same positive things we need to do in our situation right now as a community of faith at Sunshine Salvos. Being in isolation, crying and feeling the lament of our situation, but then praying and resolving the best way forwards in rebuilding our situation in the best way possible. It's going to be a different rebuild than what Nehemiah did and how he did it. Nehemiah wanted to rebuild everything just the way it was. Nothing different, just everything as it was. Our rebuild is not that. We know, and we've already started to make decisions at Sunshine Salvos for what our rebuild looks like. We're going to have a faith community in who we are and what we do that will be different for having gone through this COVID-19 pandemic. There are things that we have done and done for many years at Sunshine Salvos that we will 
cease doing because we find ourselves now in a season where we can critically assess the way that we move forwards and rebuild the structures and the constructs around what holds us up and defines us as a community of faith in our broader community of Brimbank. We are going to be doing things differently. This is different, isn't it? Worshipping like this. Even when gathered worship comes back, we're going to continue an element of digital worship so that weekly there will be a message or something on YouTube and Facebook for those who can't get down to church. We're going to be doing new things. But as I said before, we're also going to be taking some of the things we've done for many years and saying those things have had their time and, and, and putting an end to those ministries. But importantly, may we always remember, despite Nehemiah's efforts to rebuild the walls, that Sunshine Salvos is a faith community without walls. The walls that we rebuild are not walls that keep people out. There are no walls. We'll certainly be re-establishing gates, entry points, access points for people to come in, to be served, to be ministered to, but also to get to know God. We'll certainly be re-strengthening and re-establishing gateways in who Sunshine Salvos is in that way. So Nehemiah's resolve is complex. It's not black and white, it's pretty gray. It's a little shady on the sides. At its heart though, there is a single minded resolve and a willingness to do the best of what he understood was needed at that time and to do his best for God. We can also resolve to do that at Sunshine Salvos in who we are. As I said, in the coming weeks, we're going to take a tour around all of the gates and some of the walls of Jerusalem and just see what those particular gateways speak to us at Sunshine Salvos in who we are and what we aspire to do in the days ahead. On the road back to being fully gathered again, equipped and mobilised to serve fully and freely in our community. Let us pray. Thank you, God. Even for a figure like Nehemiah, who was a man, he was a person in the context, he was flawed in many ways, as we all are, as we all have our motivations that are very human, that are very bound to our particular contexts and times. Lord, we can still say thank you for someone like Nehemiah who shows us in good ways and in not so good ways. That it's positive to have a single minded resolve to try and achieve something for a community of faith. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help guide us in our journey forwards, in how we rebuild, in how we re establish existing gateways into Sunshine Salvos, but also build new gateways and do new things. Lord, help us to see the new things, as your word tells us, the new things that you're doing that spring up in our very midst. Lord, help us and give us wisdom and give us resolve, strong Nehemiah-like resolve, the kind of resolve that gets things done. Give us that strength and purposed resolve, Lord, to be able to move forwards in the best way possible. For, for your glory's sake, Lord, we pray that we would rebuild and re-emerge out of this COVID-19 pandemic to be more equipped, to be more effectual, to be a better community of faith at Sunshine Salvos. Help us to do that, Lord. And of course, in our own lives, help us to do that because we too are your church. Help build us up, mould us, make us, break us where needed, rebuild us. Lord, help us as people, as your living, walking, talking churches 
help us to also move forwards with you and bless us as we do that we pray in jesus name amen a benediction to leave with you today as a final blessing may the lord bless you and protect you may the lord smile upon you and be gracious to you and may the lord show you his face and his favor be given to you this week as you journey forwards with resolve to be a bigger better version and person to serve our god in your locale bless bless us god as we do this this week we pray amen and god bless you this week as you go about being a blessing to others in times that are still difficult and still challenging lord we do pray that you would strengthen us and i pray that god would bless you in doing that and being strong and courageous and resolute in moving forwards thank you for joining us again here this morning we look forward to sharing with you again next week we're going to be looking at the first of our gates of jerusalem i think it would be the sheep gate so we will see you then have a lovely week stay warm stay safe stay isolated where you can where you need to but be blessed see you next week